All right, everyone. Welcome to School of DevOps. This is Gaurav Shah, and uh, we are going to get started. Welcome to this 90-day DevOps challenge, where we're building end-to-end -end use case and implementing all DevOps practices in 90 days. And we are on the mission number five this week. That's about Cloudify. And we are going to get started building infrastructure on cloud, AWS cloud, with a specific, very specific, small use case, a real life like use case. And uh, let's review what we've done so far. So we started with mission one, week one, uh, with containers. We extended that and learned about building container images, packaged an application. We looked at how to implement branching models and uh, pull request based workflows, Git based workflows with Git of, uh, with the third mission, Git of five. Last week, we learned how to create a continuous integration pipeline with Jenkins. This week, we're going to take up a use case of a web application and learn how to build the infrastructure on cloud for it. Uh, before that, let me say hi to everyone. So Vijay, I see Vijay, Deepak, Man Manoj, Udit, Suraj, Janmajay, Sai, Abhishek. Welcome everyone again. I also see Olavle, Monica, Manoj, Deepak, Ashish, Austin. So uh, feel free to say hi. And uh, uh, the chat is available here. Uh, you can start posting questions out there as well. And I will get to the questions as usual whenever I uh, get a breather. But feel free to start posting questions and uh, you know post it there. Yeah, so finally I got to, <laughs> got to shave as well, yes. Uh, Bishek, so thanks a lot. Um, it's generally a weekly thing for me, um, but Sunday I was busy. I was doing a workshop and I was busy. So, you know, today was the day when I got to finally do it. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, but that's um, that's the life of a techie, isn't it? So you shave once in a week and, um, you know, that's a weird thing mostly. All right. So let's get started with this week's agenda. We are going to talk about uh, how to build an in, uh, infrastructure and deploy an application, um, you know, on AWS for this particular use case. This is slightly divergent from our Craftista application. It's a simple PHP uh, two-tier application with uh, PHP frontend that you see here and a database backend. I really like it because you know it has uh, all the components of a, a web interface and a learning application that we need for cloud. Uh, it's a simple application, works on even a free tier instance. So that's a good thing about it. And then it shows you visually like whether it is connected to database or not, uh, whether the schema update or not. So when we bring in the components of database and connect it together, uh, this is really useful to have an application like this. Right. So uh, about recording Suraj, uh, recording has been published on our channel school of devops so if you haven't subscribed to the channel uh, on youtube you should do that it's all uh, already there today um, you can see that previous recording and there is a playlist also so if you look at the playlist there is a playlist called as 90 day devops challenge amongst uh, many other playlists and this is where let me pause it uh, this is where you'll find all the missions so mission one two three four um, all of those are there. So what we say as, uh, uh, let's say, complete continuous integration pipeline with Jenkins, that's the mission number four. I've just named it slightly differently, but that's really the recording for mission number four. It's all there, don't worry. Um, okay, coming back to the use case, this is a very simple use case with a PHP frontend and a, a database backend. How are we going to build it on cloud? Uh, let's have a look at that architecture. And we will eventually, so we're going to spend two weeks with cloud. The first iteration this week, we will build the, you know, the components, the basic components like VPCs, infrastructure components like VPC, EC2, RDS. And when we come back for the next mission, which is going to be one week after next, next week is the uh, break because I'll be traveling. And when we come back, we will uh, talk about auto scaling, where we'll talk about a bunch of things like images, uh, auto scaling groups. Um, load balancers, you know, uh, how does the target group and load balancers work, different types of load balancers, the actual auto scaling. I will show you doing the auto scaling um, practically by running load test and then also some advanced auto scaling policies that we can implement as well. So all of that we will combine together in the next session that is auto scaling. So on cloud, we'll spending two sessions. First, just 
basic building blocks of cloud today and then later on we'll do some advanced things as well now uh, how are we building this two-tier infrastructure that uh, for this application devops demo let's call it as a devops demo app it's a php application with mysql as the database backend so that's where we bring in the rds or a database uh, server concept service from aws so it's going to look like this so we will start by creating a secure infrastructure on cloud that's the fundamental thing that we need whenever we set up infrastructure on cloud fundamentally has to be secure how do we secure that is using something called as a virtual private cloud and that is created as a network vpc is like a network and then you divide it into subnet so that part of the infrastructure can be hosted publicly part of it remains private what that means is our web servers will be hosted in the public side of the infrastructure and uh, the database will be hosted in our private infrastructure here which means that if there is an external users the external users can access the web server but they cannot access the database the application can access the database because they're part of the same network this that's the reason why we create something called as a network here and that's the reason why we uh, divide that into subnets as well uh, all right so that's uh, how it is so uh, this is what we are going to do and then we start, start scaling it out uh, scaling up uh, scaling out horizontally that's what we'll talk about in the next week so how do we build this secure infrastructure and then uh, deploy the ec2 instances rds database and then we'll also talk about the storage and we will learn about something cool with the storage where i'll show you how to deploy your static site completely static site you can create your own personal site and host it on aws as well how could you do that with s3 i uh, will talk about that today so today we'll talk about vpc we'll talk about ec2 we'll talk about rds and will this build this step by step build this infrastructure uh, initially starting with virtual private cloud and then uh, onward to ec2 and rds so let's talk about this virtual private cloud and how do we host or build the infrastructure on aws now if you look at the aws even before we start talking about this we have a concept of regions and availability zones in aws uh, aws comes with a global infrastructure let me log into aws and show you this is aws console and if i uh, use the drop down from the top right corner you see around 25 plus regions which are available which means that as soon as you create an aws account you can host your infrastructure globally across the globe right in like few hours you can go global with aws because it offers those many regions and you can pick a region to launch your server and that could be based on let's say your clients are in a particular region you want to host your infrastructure closer to them very much you can do that and within these regions they have concept of availability zones to simplify that concept let me give you an analogy let's say we have a region called as southern india let's say we have southern india as a region now within this southern india aws hosts different infrastructures and different data centers so let's say they may have three data centers there is a data center in chennai there is a data center in bangalore there is a data center in hyderabad there are three different cities in southern part of india so there are these di different data centers and they are connected via high speed low latency links so they can be connected via high speed low latency links even the, this there can be connection between these so this is a concept of regions which is a particular geography yeah and then within that region there are different data centers in different cities let's imagine that and they're just connected with direct links high speed low latency direct lease lines and cables and all that and why does aws provide this kind of infrastructure is for high availability so that you can host your infrastructure let's say there is there are web servers that you want to host you host it in same region but you host it in different data centers so that if suppose there is a flood in bangalore or if there is a calamity 
in Bangalore and there are power outage and whatnot and some natural calamities there. Uh, this data center is down. Despite that, you can still have your, you know, part of your infrastructure available in uh, maybe in two different cities still there. And that's the concept of availability zone. So each of this is called as availability zone. Typically it is called uh, named as availability zone A, availability zone B, availability zone C, but that is what it is. And that's the purpose of having multiple availability zones because each of the availability zone is a different physical data center with its own internet lines coming in, with its own power lines coming in, redundant power and network coming in, even for that one data center. And then we have redundancy at the level of data, you know, that region, regional level where, you know, even if, okay, that place is not available, you can have that up so that you're not affected by the outage in one specific, you know, uh, one specific place or one specific data center. And then between regions, why do you use region for, avail uh, why do you use availability zones for uh, easy, uh, availability? Why not use region because let's say you may say that okay there is a region called as south india and then there is a region called as uh, you know um singapore or japan there's a region in tokyo right so why not host your infrastructure in tokyo right for high availability the problem with that is if you host one server here and one server here that is costly affair because this data travels over internet there is internet in between so it will be slow. It will also have like a bit of a latency. That's why it is slow. And then it is also costly because there is a, there is a charge here. So whatever goes in here, over here, uh, cost you money. If you have, uh, let's say database here and the web server here, uh, this is free. This will cost you money, right? This is free. So that is how it has been designed for availability zones for high availability region for one is something like dr so you have your whole you know main primary instances here and you back up your servers here or keep a dr infrastructure in a different region that's quite valid or maybe you are a global organization like someone like uber for example where you have presence in india you have presence in southeast asia you have presence in europe you have presence in us so you will have infrastructure everywhere. So if you want to host your infrastructure globally, closer to your clients, or if you want to set up DR policy, you can possibly use different regions and so on and so forth. So that's where uh, it would make more sense, right? So regions are for DR and for, you know, like partitioning your infrastructure and place, placement of the resources versus for high availability, you exclusively use the same region, but availability zones. Now, if you understand these topics, the availability zones and so on, when we want to host or leverage the availability zones, let's say we have two availability zones, AZ, B and availability zone C. That is how they are named. I'm going to take an example of Northern California region, simple because it has only two availability zones, easy to understand also. And if you want to host your infrastructure in these two availability zones, what you have to create is first of all, you'll have to create a network with a virtual private cloud and it has an IP address space. So when you create a network, you also design the IP address space. So let's suppose this, the network, when you create it, the IP address space, this is called as a CIDR block and it is about 65,000 IPs. So let's think of it as 64K. And then you can divide it into sub networks and essentially you will have to create at the minimum four subnets. Why? Because if you want to leverage the availability zones, like for high availability, and if you want to host your web servers or infrastructure in different AZs, web servers, databases, both, you essentially need to create at least two different subnets for that to support that. So at least two subnets. So this kind of a partitioning is must because this is the thing which will allow you to create, use more than one availability zones. Secondly, your web servers are public. Your databases are not. So you also need some partitioning here where you want to create 
public infrastructure and private infrastructure how do you partition your infrastructure is using these sub networks you have a one larger network with 64000 ips and then you create sub networks and when you create sub networks you say that i am creating the subnet let's say this is my public subnet one i have four subnets public subnet one this is my public subnet two uh, i am going to have private subnet one and the private subnet two and then i will divide this network so this larger network you have to divide this into sub networks and then i can partition it various different ways i'm going to give you a very simple way of doing this is if i have this kind of a cider block cider block as in the ip space i divide it into two and say this is my network address these are the hosts i have and i'll partition into one more block and say this is my subnet like till here is my subnet and this is where my hosts are so what that means is i am basically partitioning it this way this subnet will have 10 0 1 1 0.0 will also work just for simplicity i'll create it this way so this 24 says this is the subnet these are the hosts slash 16 says this is the network these are my hosts i am not going in depth into cider notations i generally do that with vpc but you can go uh, and check my course on aws which is part of our school of devops site and you can basically learn about this in depth so we have a in depth session on vpcs and subnets and cider blocks and so on this itself will take about an hour to hour uh, for me to explain all right so uh, okay so i think i'm just going to switch off my video for the time being so that uh, it is not blocking your view okay give me one quick moment all right all right this should work now and then i switch off my video all right this should be better uh now it shouldn't be blocking all right uh okay so now let's uh, say we want to create these kind of sub networks and you can use a cider calculator also for this to uh, if you are not sure how this works and all that so uh let's say this is a network 10000 and i will show you by creating a vpc first so that at the time of vpc i'll show explain this to you so i will basically say this is my 10.0.2.0 right so i'm incrementing this number if you realize it this part is for my sub networks this is the vpc this is for the sub networks so this gives me 10.0.4.0/24 or let's say 1 2 3 and 4.0 here so this is 1 this is 2 this is 3 this is 4 right so i'm just partitioning a larger network into smaller networks that is one way of doing it there are various ways of partitioning this uh, i'm keeping it simple and i will create a vpc and show you this now how what makes it a public subnet or a private subnet is difficultly there is something called as a route table the routes that you add makes it public or private if it is a private route table you typically have the route table rules which will look like this your network address and say it will have local what that means is this is network rule which says that oh anyone here can talk to anyone here anyone here can talk to anyone here anyone here can talk to anyone here and vice and versa so basically you are allowing the communication within this virtual private network with this kind of a configuration and then if you have a if you want to go outside like if this has to happen if you want to allow access to come into your web servers and so on 
uh, you still need this rule for local communication. And in addition to that, you'll typically have 0.0.0.0, .0 which will say go via internet gateway. So there is something called as an internet gateway and this allows actually this con connection goes via this. So anything which comes in, anything that goes out, goes via the internet gateway there. Okay, is my screen frozen? Probably yes. Okay, I may have to restart. This is a this is a very bad situation because my screen gets frozen during my live sessions, generally with Microsoft Teams. But today it's gone. Uh, okay, so what we'll have to do is I will have to restart my system, unfortunately. And uh, I am not sure how the webinar is going to work, but I'll try to reconnect using the same link and uh, just be here or just try to reconnect in a few minutes after a few minutes if this goes away. All right, can you all hear me now? I'm just checking. I hope I'm audible now, just checking in and uh, if you are able to see my screen as well, just give me the feedback and we should be able to continue. Check in, check in, hello. Not able to hear? All righty. Okay, are you able to hear now? Yes or no? I'm not sure. All right. Okay, so uh, what am I using to draw? I basically project my iPad and uh, I have a tool called as Explain Everything. Uh, it's an app basically on iPad and it's a fantastic app. I have been using it for a while and not only that, uh, you may see all my presentations are created with explain everything and it allows me to record the presentations also sometimes when I want to create courses and then replay them. So a very useful tool if you uh, want to kind of present things and all. I found this to be the best tool uh, available so far. Okay, so since you are able to hear me all right and able to see, um, let's continue and I will switch off uh, uh, my camera two
all right so how do we build this and we were talking about route tables and all that i will practically show you now how all of this comes together so how do we build a vpc let's look at that i have uh, i'm logged into aws and you have to pick one region first and i'm on a vpc console so you can select a service from here and i want to build a virtual private cloud so i have selected already but uh, if you're not sure you can search for virtual private cloud right that's vpc and you can also find it in the networks uh, section here so security it should be somewhere in the networking and content delivery uh, we have vpc so it's the same thing so you have vpcs here and so you can select services and you know just add them to favorites which would show up on the tab here so you can create the shortcut menu of your choice let's say now how to create a vpc this is a, a you can create a vpc using a wizard which is no brainer uh, all you have to do is say create vpc and say vpc and more uh, provide the name of the VPC. You can see this is the sub network. This is the dot not sub network, but this is the network address. What this says is I have uh, slash 16 tells you that it has about 65,000 IPs starting with 10.0.0.0 all the way to 10.0.255.255. And you can divide that into sub network. That's up to you how you want to divide it. I'm going to give you a simple mechanism that is slash 24 slash 24 divides it halfway and it is clean because then you can increment this number for the next network because this goes from 0, uh, 0 to 0 0.255 that is one sub network that you can divide it in and since 0 0.255 is the next last one 255 is the max then this will get incremented to one so the next subnet is this 1.0 to 1.255 and then it would increment uh, by one more that is 2.0 and it will go on to 2.55 why this is easy is because if i choose something else let's say slash 20. slash 20 is slightly tricky if you are familiar with things it is not that but uh, it is slightly tricky because the network goes from 10.0.0.0 to 10.0.15.255 so if i use 2.0 as well it is part of the same network 5.0 part of the same network this is not changing only if you go and the next network will be slash 16.0 only then will this change now this is a different sub network all the way till 31.255 and then 32 will be the next network and so on so if you want to keep it absolutely simple slash 24 it is right so this itself is a different network 32.0 to 32.255 so what i'm going to do is use this as my vpc side block and then choose let's say two public subnets two private subnets here if you use a wizard this is as simple as it gets you can see it creates a vpc this is a good uh, they have added this recently the preview and this is the vpc with four subnets in two availability zones 1b and 1c so this is my public subnet because it has access to the internet gateway and this is a private subnet which doesn't this is a public subnet this is a private subnet you can see the route tables and network connections here right here and if you want to keep it simple just create a vpc using a visit uh two public subnet two private subnet and uh, i can switch this off this is not needed for us uh, so you can see public subnets only the public subnets have internet project internet gateway so if i choose the internet gateway it only shows up for or lights up only the public subnets. What this is showing you is exactly what I drew here. Four subnets, two public, two private in two different availability zones. So four subnets, four subnets, two public, two private, two different availability zones, 1B and 1C that's exactly what it is so let me create a vpc see it creates everything subnets internet gateways route tables uh, i'll just explore and show you some of these configurations also so i have a vpc now with its four subnets 
uh, you are going to see now the subnets etc once the vpc is there so this is the product vpc ending 5b that's my vpc id if i look at the subnets let me refresh because it should have four subnets two private two public right uh, you can see the uh, since i used a wizard it has created the networks automatically it is a slash 20 network slash 20 network is what i just showed you so if it is 16.0 or let's say 144.0 slash 20 what that means is the starting address is slash 20 starting address is this ending address is this and that's the reason why uh, you see it increments by like you know around 16 or so the previous one was 128 that went till 143.255 that's the reason why the next subnet is 144 right so that's how the cider blocks typically work the ip addressing still works like that uh, i would highly recommend looking at my vpc related uh, sections in the aws course uh, for the in-depth understanding of this uh, these concepts quite useful to have that now how uh, uh, once we have the vpc like what makes it this this is a public subnet or private subnet is the route tables these route tables associated with these subnets make it public or private you can easily identify that by not by the name but by the route table because this is one of the troubleshooting things so if you are not able to access your application you've set it up but you're not able to access the application one of the issues could be the route tables not not set up properly so this you see is the private subnet this allows communication only for between the nodes in that network right and this keeps your infrastructure this is we are setting this up on cloud this is going to keep your infrastructure separate than mine if i create a vpc even if i create a vpc with the same block my vpc and your vpc will be different it will be isolated and that's how we keep this isolation where oh my resources are isolated from everyone else's including yours that's the fundamental feature of uh, uh, that you need to set up isolation on the cloud that is the vpc and this is how we do it and then we partition it in a way that oh some part of the infrastructure we can make this public the web servers the databases we can keep it private so you can do that if you have this kind of a setup with uh, four subnets two public two private that's the vpc part now let's set up the web server within this vpc i'm going to create the web server so i have i'm showing you step by step so what we have right now is a virtual private cloud with four subnets and now i'm going to deploy the ec2 instance ec2 stands for elastic compute cloud when we say elastic what does that mean elastic is the capacity so you can Basically, you're renting a renting a server on a virtual machine in a, a managed environment, and you can rent two or twenty or two hundred or two thousand. That's up to you. It's like a utility model. You pay at the end of the month. It's like electricity bill, right? You don't have to worry about where the power is coming from. The electricity just gets connected at your home, and you are getting charged based on the number of units that you utilize per month that's the utility model that's exactly what happens here as well so cloud has made compute an infrastructure uh, into a and you you're getting this provided as into a utility model basically so how do we set up this infrastructure ec2 instance is what i'm going to demonstrate next and for that i'll switch to ec2 as a service and with EC2, you have something called as an instance. And there are different types of instances, some by configuration, some by pricing. So there is two different types of categorization. Configuration-wise, the instance types are easy to understand, like small, medium, large. And then there are different series of instances. 
like T is the series, C is another series. So T is a general purpose thing. You use it for mainly trying things out and some general purpose utilization. If you have a compute heavy service, use C series. If you have a GPU intensive service, use GPU instances. If you have memory intensive, you have R2 series. So there are different types of instances and you'll see if you keep on exploring, there are so many different types of instances which are available and right sizing your instances also is a kind of an art because you have to look at your workload, find out what it requires because if you have a random IO operations for a database, uh, you need a certain type of an instance which gives you a better disk performance, right? And that is a random IO versus data warehousing, where is there is a sequential IO with uh, uh, large storage requirements. You have a D series instances, which are dense storage IO. So, you know, you have different series of instances and based on your workload, based on the capacity that you need, uh, you can pick an instance based on the pricing that you are okay with, you are going to pick a particular type of instance. For example, this instance comes with 64 cores, 256 gigs of RAM, RAM, not the disk size, and uh, 25 gigabit of network performance. And this costs you around $6 a month a, per hour. So that's gonna cost you around, you know, 720 into six, approximately I'm giving you around $4,300 per month, right? Versus uh, M series or T2 series, right? So something like, uh, this one with two cores and four gigs of RAM is going to cost you much lesser in maybe tens or twenties of dollars. And uh, um, that's going to come to around monthly $52, right? So that's how much it's going to cost this one. So the pricing varies uh, for the instances, and this is the on-demand pricing. So I told you that there are two different categories of instances. One is by the configuration like this and the second is by pricing where you have on demand which is the default you also have spot instances and you have reserved instances reserved is like you're just reserving the capacity for a year for three years and you get it for cheaper and spot instances is yet completely different ball game because with spot instances aws is essentially bidding their excess capacity aws always has the excess capacity right because all the clouds and this is applicable to all clouds by the way so the clouds have excess capacity so they bid it as in you can bid for a particular instance let's say the on-demand price is one dollar you say that i am willing to pay 50 cents for this one fine so there is an on-demand price it remains below this for a long time but when it breaches this your price when it breaches this basically beyond this the instance will be gone you can have the request in a way that oh when it comes down again your instance is given back to you or not that instance but a similar instance but between this time it may be gone as well so this is like a you get the instance for cheaper much cheaper than normal uh, on demand pricing but you should be ready for disruptions at times. So if you have a mission critical application, your web servers, you can't run 100% of your web servers on it. Maybe 20%, 30%, you can still do it, but not 100%. Uh, so you have to be ready for the disruption. But there are a lot of use cases where this works well for bad jobs. You want to run something once in a day. Uh, you're not, in a sense, it's not time sensitive. So you can use that uh, spot instance strategy as well. You can see the history here. Uh, so you can, and this is depending on the region and the availability zones. And you can look at some of the large instances are very cheap because those are not used very often. So you see, this is uh, for the last three months. The on-demand price is about $1.50. You're getting it for like 50% off, right? Some instances are even cheaper than that. Only thing is, at times, it might uh, go away, right? This is available for, again, 50% off. Uh, this may be even cheaper. Yeah, this is even cheaper. So you can save a lot of money by using spot instances if your workloads 
support that kind of a uh, you know like that kind of a model where it may go away uh, for a while so that's about uh, the spot um, instances let me show you by creating an instance for the web server here this uh, use case where we want to launch a web server I launch an instance and then while launching that instance I will also configure the web server application that DevOps demo application this one has a script if you run that script it will launch uh, or install that application and configure it on uh, let's say an Ubuntu instance I'll show you there is a way to define that script as well somewhere So this is the script. If I run this script on Ubuntu server, it launches that uh, or sets up the web server also. So what I'm going to do here is uh, launch an instance. Before that though, I need a couple of things because if I want to connect to that instance from my laptop here or a, you know my desktop here, uh, I need a SSH key pair. So I'll have to establish a SSH connection. So I need a SSH key pair first. Secondly, I need to define some security group so that it decides, oh, 22 port is allowed, uh, 80 port is allowed, maybe 443 is allowed, whatever it is, right? So you have to define that per instance basis. This is called as a security group. What you configure as a firewall of sorts is a security group configuration. So I need to do that first before launching the actual instance. I'll create a key pair so that I can connect to it and I will name it as uh, with the name of the region as well because this if I create it from AWS is uh, uh, specific to the region and I'm just downloading a PEM file if you are using Windows you will download PPK this gives me a private key and then the public this is the public key what I got on my system is Call as a private key. I'm just copying it to a place where I keep my SSH keys and then I'll have to change the permissions also. I'll show it to you once I'm trying to connect. So this is one of the prerequisites. Secondly, security group, it is good to keep it ready. Again, all of this when you create it is part of one particular VPC security group, uh, the instance. So when you create it, you'll have to create it for that VPC. So I'm creating a security group for my web application and uh, and then let me use my VPC. It's called as a project VPC. And this is where I add my rules, like, oh, what access I want to allow. SSH access from right now anywhere. Or I can also be specific saying that, oh, only my IP. It detects my IP. Whatever my public IP is, it will detect it automatically. Or if you're not sure, initially, anywhere is fine. But a better idea is to provide some IP block, if possible. Uh, HTTP connection since this is a public facing web server this should be anywhere we don't have https for this application so just ssh and http is fine you don't change outbound rules you do not touch it if you touch this it will have a problem uh, with your application will not work properly at all uh, so do not touch this part uh, just when you're trying this out on your own later uh, by looking at the recording just change the inbound rule if you See a problem, one of the things that to check is security group and outbound rule. If you have touched it, you'll have to bring this back to like this. So just all traffic and allow for all. So creating a security group here. As you can see, it has the inbound rule for 22 and 80. Outbound rules, everything is open. This has to be there. And now that I have these two prerequisites taken care of, the security group and key pair, I can create my instance, the web server. So there are five, six configurations here. First is the name of the instance. 
second is the image now this works with ubuntu this is typically known to you when you're deploying an application you typically know what operating system you're going to use and all that typically will be dis you know published somewhere or you would know if you are working on it already so ubuntu is the base operating system that we want to use here uh, when you try this out i'm assuming you have a free tier account even though i don't have a free tier account i'm going to pick the same instance that you would everything that i show you here is eligible for the free tier remember that right so do not use any other type of instance than whatever you see with free tier also choose the same region northern california so that you get consistent result like this because in northern california t2 micro is the free tier some regions it is t3 micro or something so whatever it is you choose the free tier gives us one core one gb of ram but that is sufficient for this application key pair this is why we created one so that we could choose it immediately network configuration needs to be changed to the vpc of your choice now the one you created product vpc in this case subnet has to be public remember that so this has chosen private subnet no it has to be a public subnet any public subnet is fine for the web server there is one configuration which is very important because if you want to connect to your web server it has to have a publicly available or reachable ip address so you have to set this to enable for now if you are going via load balancer let's say when we set up a load balancer later uh, this may not be needed but right now this server has to have the public ip so i'm selecting this to be enabled selecting the security group which is already available so to avoid all this configuration from here we have already created one storage we don't change it creates a storage with uh, 8 gb let's keep it as that and uh, advanced details is where you also have a way to run the scripts at the launch time uh, when you provision a server ec2 instance there is a way to automatically run a script does anyone know what configuration that is Okay, Vijay has a question. Can't we use our authentication other than SSH keys? Uh, well, with a Linux server, typically you are going to use SSH uh, to connect to a remote server. And that's the reason why SSH. And SSH is a very reliable, uh, secure uh, way to authenticate to a server. It's reliable and secure because you never leave your private key. You don't have to share it with anyone. Unlike many other authentication methods, and there's only public key. Uh, it's a challenge response authentication, a very interesting and secure way of doing it because you never have to with the good thing about SSH and the way it is designed and why it is so popular is because that's a remote server. You have your own private key here. This key, whatever the private key is, and there is a relevant public key here. The authentication works this way. Okay when you connect to a server server sends you a challenge challenge is like some garbled text some random text it encrypts using the public key and sends it to you and the only entity in the world who can decrypt this is you with the private key that is the reason why it is secure because public key anyone can steal no problems even if somebody takes the public key and runs away uh, let them do that it's not going to help them at all because when you try to authenticate, uh, the public key can only be used to send you a challenge. And using that challenge, you can respond. And if you respond, okay, the server will allow you to connect. That's the only thing that can do. So if you're not talking to someone who's going to take your key away, it doesn't matter. So only if you're connecting to that server, it would come into play. And that way, this private key remains private with you. Uh, public key can be shared with anyone, doesn't matter. Uh, and it's a secure way. And this is this channel is encrypted after that whatever you do is all encrypted channel and you can do so many things with ssh beyond this like tunneling and whatnot and so on so ssh is the way it is done okay so karthik uh, mentions about the cloud in it yes so cloud in it is there on all um, these modern cloud servers 
And then the way you do it, as Udit mentioned, is user data. So the cloud in it, in case of AWS, uh, you have to provide the user data and that user data is provided to something called as cloud in it, which initializes everything. And that will set up uh, the, uh, whatever you want to do here. So this script will run here and I can copy this and paste it as this, or if I have a longer script, I can encode it as base 64 as well. It will just look like this. Uh, if I encode it as base 64 and then I will encode it and copy it. Basically it shortens it. Even if you have a really long script, even if it is like three times the size, right? So you see, I'm just copying it multiple times. Uh, no, I'll copy the script multiple times. So even if I have a really long file, I've copied it a few times. Your base 64, it's not gonna be too long, right? It's gonna be much smaller than that. And it typically gets accommodated in this kind of a space. That's the base 64 encoding. So this is a script I'm gonna run directly, but you can also add a base 64 if you want, encoded format. And let me just review this configuration for the instance for you. So you provide the name when you create it, you provide the name, that's number one. In image, number two, Number three is the instance type, free tier eligible. Number four, key pair. Number five, VPC, very important. Number six, select the public subnet. Number seven, a very, very important configuration is auto assign public IP. Number eight, select the security group that you've created. And then number nine is the user data. So with those nine configurations, we should have our web server all running. Just within a minute. So EC2 instance shows up here and it gives me all this information right here. So when you create an instance, you get, uh, you know, what is the public IP? This public IP will not be there if you do not choose, choose number seven or to assign public IP. It's very important. Unless you have this, you cannot connect to it directly. You'll have to use some other mechanism, but that's not what I recommend. Uh, private IP, this is for from the VPC. So there is, uh, internal IP, there is an external IP. And it tells you everything about this instance, right from key pair, uh, right from which network it belongs to. And you have tabbed uh, status as well. So you can see the status. You have a status for the system and the instance. Instance is your so, VM, the one here. This VM ultimately runs on some physical system server. That is the system status. So sometimes there is a problem here. If there is a problem here, a quick trick is to stop the instance, start it again. When you stop an instance and start it again, it gets created on a completely new hardware, right? So that's a quick way of sh um, shifting your instance to a new hardware. If you're getting performance issues, maybe there's something with the hardware, a lot of it's overloaded. So stop it, start it, it will come back, come up on a new server. You see monitoring data? Four minute monitoring right now and uh, you have security information like what is the security group if you are not able to access your instance check your outgoing incoming security access check your networking configuration specifically subnet subnet has to be public how do i say this is public not by the name but by the route table always trust the route table more than the name if you see internet gateway in the route table it is a public subnet. These are also troubleshooting steps. If your instance, you're not able to access it, the web server, uh, these are the things you'll have to check. Security groups, subnets, and then finally the application. Uh, let me show you that cloud in it thing because you can also check from monitoring troubleshooting, this action monitoring troubleshooting, the system log. And in the system log, you are going to see what happened during the boot time. It may appear in a, in a minute. And while that is happening, let's check if the instance is available.
Yes, so it shows me Apache. So it is there. It has configured with Apache, but application is not yet there. So most likely that installation of the script is happening. The script which will install Apache. It, this has happened. It has yet to deploy the application. When the application comes up, you are going to see a different page altogether here. And uh, we may have to wait for a few minutes for that to happen, right? And I'm just trying to see if I get the logs. System logs, you will see it. And this is where you'll see that, oh, this application was being launched, configured, and uh, now you see the app there, right? It took a few minutes because it took time for the script to execute and complete. And the reason why I like this is, even though it's simple, it has a working UI and it has all this connection. It has a PHP code which checks for the database and which checks for some information, piece of information in the database table. So even if the database is available and connected, you still need to wait for the schemas to be there and all that, right? So that way you can do all sort of validation here. Now this is the front end set up in a public subnet. This is a public subnet and we are able to access it from outside through this security group and so on. You can also connect via SSH. Let me show you that. Uh, I have the key pair here, SSH minus I and my key. And I'll connect using Ubuntu. If you're not sure, try connecting as root. It will tell you which user to use. If you're not sure which user to use, try with root typically will tell you uh, which user. You should be connecting as that is. Let's say root at the rate this. Now, first thing that's gonna tell me something else and that is the unprotected private key file. This happens when the file permissions are not correct the permission on this file should be restricted to be not readable by anyone else apart from the user. Right now, it is readable by everyone on the system. This is not secure. So I'll change the permission to either 600. So read, write. I maintain this and say nothing for anyone else or even 400, which will make it read only. So if I say 600, it will retain these permissions. Let me try that. Should work. So I just disable the permission for anywhere else. And now if I try to connect using same SSH command, now it's gonna tell me that root user you're not supposed to connect as. So use Ubuntu rather than root. So you typically would know either uh, Ubuntu for Ubuntu systems. If you use Amazon Linux, it is EC2 user. So these are common usernames. If you're using a custom image, it might have its own username. And this is how you connect using SSH, right? And you can see this log and uh, this typically tells me what happened during the boot time and whatnot as well. Uh, and then there is D message the boot log for the system, right? And uh, you should see the syslog actually as part of the instance state here, system log as well. Yes, so you see here, it was trying to use that cloud in it. This cloud in it is the one which reads the script and start executing it. So whatever you want to run during the provisioning time, you provide it as the user data and that user data is the one which provides that script to the cloud in it which is the program running inside that image and that would automatically uh, do your provisioning stuff that's how we got this application now this application is there the front end is there the database is still not there so how do we provision the database is the next part that i'm going to show you 
the database when i launch it i want to make sure i launch it in a private subnet this should be private what that means is it would not be available from the external user still vpc communication is still available so this can connect to this as well. that is fine that is available how do i launch this database is where i would use a service from aws called as rds relational database service essentially it is a managed database service that is what it is and that to use that i'll go to the rds console and i'll start creating that database to create the database there is some process because you have to create something called as a subnet group even if you create one instance of it because there is a concept of multi az database where you have a master and you have a standby it's a multi az thing right so you have basically availability z b and c so if this is not available this will take over this is all automatic this automatic failover is already available with multi az and you have a capability of adding the standby later or you have a capability of creating replicas again in different availability zones so for database the prerequisite is you have to create a db subnet group to define where all your db instances can be created otherwise it can get created here or here you don't want that you want it to be restricted only in this and this subnet so you have to create a subnet group then you launch the database i'll show you how to do that so i'll first create the subnet group for database choose the vpc and when i select the subnets here i have to select the private subnets only in these two availability zones only private subnets and my private subnets are easily identifiable with their cider blocks actually or no if not you can go back to vpc and find out their names also i know for sure that 128 and 144 are my private you can check it from vpc when you use wizard that's what it does the private subnets are like 128 the higher numbers are private subnets the lower numbers are public these are public these are private so i select the private subnet so i'm restricting my dbs to be created only in these private subnets that's what it is create and uh, that's my subnet group and now i'm going to create a database which database it will be a mysql database so there are various options i have there is a mysql there is um aws optimized version of mysql a better performance highly optimized version of it called as aurora or i can use a fork of mysql called as mariadb this is open source fork version of my mysql i'm going to go with that uh what is important when you choose to create it is stick to free tier what free tier does is it disables the if you choose production what it does is it selects a large instance expensive plus it creates a multi az environment meaning it creates a master and a standby primary and a standby meaning two instances you're paying twice that's the setup it is good for production not for our testing dev test selects a large instance but single uh, a single instance only not multi az free tier sticks to small instance t3 micro and it completely disables this option so that you can't choose it accidentally either which is a good thing for now so that's the one i'm going to choose so maria db template is free tier uh db instance identifier i'll call it as devops db or devops demo uh this can be anything like admin is fine whatever password you want to provide so admin and the password you have to remember whatever the password you provided here 
uh, everything else is like default connectivity wise we choose vpc and the subnet group subnet group is already selected here we don't want this to be exposed to the public anyway so set, set this to no vpc security group has to be created again for this so you have to create one let's say database availability zone we don't care where it comes up so no problems there and then there is some additional configuration where you choose dbnet devops db in this case this database gets created so that when the application connects it is going to connect to that particular database and search for some table so that's the database uh, that's it you can this is a managed service so it enables the automated backups uh, you know and all of that so i'm gonna switch it off for now just testing it but you can have all this maintenance and all that be automated as well and even though it shows you the pricing here if it is free tier and if your account is enabled for the free tier meaning it is new account less than one year old uh, you are eligible for free tier then you don't have to worry about this pricing either so i'm going to create a database and uh, let it be launched once the ddb db comes up i will have to configure now you have some other additional options as well like you can set up some caching for database using elastic cache service you have a proxy uh, where you can you know split your reads and writes if you have multiple databases and all that so all of these are newer features of rds and rds gives you an ability to create mysql postgres oracle sql server uh, databases basically so there are, and post uh, there are five databases which are supported yeah so when you see create database you see those options there is mysql there is postgres there is oracle there is db2 and sql server so those five one two three four five uh, the database will take some time for it to be up and once it is up it will show me the endpoint so that from the web server i will connect to it but i'll have to do something here which is i have to make sure database allows the web server to connect through the security group so we have two things here one is the route table which already allows this communication so this will connect to this if there is a way to do that but there is also a security group associated with this there's a firewall so database has to allow connection from the web server and how do we select the web server and only web servers because you may have other instances as well there may be application x application y we want to disallow this only the web server so one thing you can use is this security group as a reference anything which is associated with the security group which will be the web server only you provide access to that so you can provide access via security group as a reference so this is the database security group and we want to allow okay there is some default rule which is of no use for me i'm gonna allow access to mysql which is port number 3306 from where is the question this is what i was talking about you can define a ip address block or something or you can use a security group where we can select the security group that is added for the web server. So it will basically allow any instance which is associated with that security group, meaning if I create another web server with the same security group as that, it will allow me to uh, connect to the database as well. That's what we want. Only the web servers for DevOps demo. That's it, that's what it means. Yeah, so this is already in place now. If I go back to database, yet to come up, once it is up, I will go back to my web server. From the web server, I'll connect using MySQL, minus u admin, that's the username, minus h and the host name. 
uh, I'll ask for the password and connect to DevOps DB as the database. So all I need now is this host name. That's what I'm waiting for. And that does take time. In the meanwhile, if there are any questions, we can, uh, you can ask, you can start asking as well. And anyone who is new, who would like to get started uh, with the courses, coaching, and all these kind of challenges, plus a lot of course content projects, labs, and so on, you can enroll into our uh, membership program. Specifically, I would recommend you enroll into the nerd membership that gives you the best value for now, right? And you can check the pricing here. You'll see the pricing based on where you are at and you get access to our entire course library with this membership. And if you are interested in taking up that membership, we have some offers. So the offer will be presented on the screens for the next 15 minutes while we talk about it and you can avail that as well. All right, so there is a comment or a question from Narendra, uh, mostly how many AWS services we use as a DevOps engineer, a good question. Now, uh, what you should focus on as a DevOps engineer are the fundamental five, six things for sure. That includes com uh, networking and security, VPC, uh, compute, EC2, uh, EC2 and plus more, I'll come to that database, RDS, storage, which is S3 and um, auto scaling. Those five key features you must know very well. And then you need to know about uh, automation, either Terraform or CloudFormation. Mostly Terraform is good. Uh, other services include now today, container services are very important. So AK, uh, something like EKS, EC2, Kubernetes service, very useful to know, right? And then there are some auxiliary services like uh, CloudWatch for monitoring, SNS for networking, it's small, small services, very simple services to integrate. And then there are like caching services and all that. So these are some of the key services that you know about, like maybe 10 odd services, you'll uh, five services you know very well, 10 services you know up to a certain extent, and everything else is on uh, the basis of need uh, because Everything else I would say is like domain specific. So you have media services, so CDN, sometimes you'll have to use it, Route 53, you should know that part. Uh, developer tools, depending on the organization. Uh, containers, EKS is good. Uh, and then you have a application that you're working on, which is blockchain specific. You may have some specific services for that. Uh, you may have uh, uh, some media services, uh, transcoding and uh, streaming and whatnot. You may have uh, uh, EMR like MapReduce and stuff, uh, some analytic services. Uh, so there are many analytic services actually. So depending on the use case, you pick up everything else, but these are the fundamental things that you should know about uh, what I just mentioned about. Those things are very useful. Now, going back to our presentation here, the database is up. I want to connect from the web server to the database. I have everything set up. So MySQL minus U username, minus H host name, minus P will ask me the password which it has and the DB name. Since I had opened up the security group, this works. Otherwise you may have to do a little bit of debugging there. Since this works, what I need to do is I have to provide the same configuration in the web server configs as well, which is this config.ini. That's the file read by the application here to see if it is able to connect to the web a database or not. That's why it says failure because the configuration uh, database is there. It was missing earlier and now the configuration has to be added as well. So let me add that. So dbhost is the database server name, which is this. Everything else, like you should be remembering, uh, you should remember which DB name, which user you have, and of course your password. So my username, my super secret password is this. 
and the DB name is DevOps DB. Environment can be anything. You can provide any name here. It just shows up on that page here, env name. And with this, this is dynamic. I don't have to restart any service. I just have to refresh the page. The PHP code will load this time successfully with the right configuration. So database is connected. So DB is present. It is able to connect, uh, but it is querying the data which is missing. So I'll have to add some SQL dump here. So it's actually there as part of that application. Somewhere here. Right, so this SQL. So I have to take the SQL file and uh, uh, load it. So what I'll do is instead of connecting uh, from here, I'll first download this SQL file. Instead of connecting like this, I'm just saying Oh, redirect this file so that it loads that on that server. And when it does, it's going to show me everything working. And it does. Right? So it's already showing up that uh, everything is working for me. Right? So that's uh, the first part of it. So what we have here so far is this setup. And you can assume that this is a multi-AZ setup because multi-AZ works like this only, just that you have a standby available for you additionally. And uh, this is what we have set up. So we created the VPC. So just to simplify this, we have uh, a virtual private cloud with four subnets, an EC2 instance, a database server, and this has been configured with everything like internet gateway, the route tables, you know, for each of this, uh, the security groups, the SSH key pairs, the connection between this and this is set up. Uh, we are able to access it from here, right? That's the first iteration. The second iteration is where we'll learn how to scale it. When we scale it, we'll have to set up a load balancer also. So that is what we're going to learn next. How do we define the order scaling? This is a five-step process. It's a multi-step process, and that's what we are going to look at in the next session when we come back here. Okay, any questions right now? Okay, if not, uh, I have one small thing that I'm gonna show you here is uh, how you can set up, like there is a storage system called as S3. S3 is a scalable, highly reliable, object-based storage what that means is you put some objects and you retrieve those objects and those are stored redundantly it's not a disk that you mount on ac2 instance and so on it's a completely different type of a storage system and you can use it for storing your media for your images your logs any large-scale data you can use it as a backup in fact one point of time an entire dropbox infrastructure yes the dropbox with the same same application that a lot of you use was hosted on S3 completely. So somebody built the organization on top of S3 actually. Netflix still uses S3 as a backend. So all the Netflix movies that you're consuming, of course, Amazon Prime too, uses AWS as a backend. Apart from that, it uses CDN and all that also. But uh, primarily the backend where all this media, all this content, all this OTT comes in. So we are using S3 every day. Any software that you downloaded recently, possibly it came from S3, right? Uh, a lot of, you know, you can host your site, entire site on S3 as well. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So S3 has a concept of buckets. So you create these buckets, look like a, looks like a, more or like a directory to you, but you can create it as a bucket and within that you store the objects. So I'm gonna create a bucket. The bucket name has to be unique and you can host your entire site on that as well. So if you do that, you typically use your site name as a bucket name also. And I'm going to choose some specific options. I want to make it public explicitly because I want to host a website and a static website and I'll create a bucket. So within this, I'll host my HTML content, which content, how do I download? There are a lot of templates available. One of that is HTML5up.net. Uh, gives you some 
pretty looking HTML templates. And you can create sites like these within a day. Gives you the site within a few minutes, but you know, just updating your data may take a day. That's all, but otherwise you can create a site very quickly. Let's say I want to create a site like this. Right. How do I do that is just download this template. It's downloaded already. And then this is where I've downloaded the template with all the files in it. Just upload it to S3. It's not a big deal at all. Uh, all those contents, I've just dropped it here. Just gonna take a moment for this to get uploaded. All right, that's it. So I have the files uploaded. All I have to do now, select all these files in this bucket, make them public. And uh, that's it. I try to access this now. Shows me the site. Yeah, and you can host it completely off S3. Very reliable solution. You, It's very cheap also. If you're using free tier, it's free uh, for you anyways. And what you can do further is, uh, since this is uh, slash something, slash something and all that. So what you typically have to do is, there is an option here. It's called as a bucket configuration or a policy. So if I go to the bucket, look at the properties. I have a way to enable this for a start website hosting. What this does is it removes that slash paths and all that so that you can point your domain to it directly. So when I enable this static website hosting, I can enable this is better because now I can take this as a CNAME and add an entry on my web server and it will just work. In fact, let me show you I have a I have a domain by that name actually by my name and I had done this previously. So I'll take this URL. Uh, I think it is, oh, it is already there. Was it there? Let me just check it one more time. US West one. Perfect. I think this is the one I needed anyways. Uh, I'm already pointing to that. Okay. So what this means is now that I have enabled this uh, uh, for website hosting, I can go to my web server, uh, DNS server host, if I have a domain name and just create an alias record, say that, oh, my domain should point to this one. What that means is now if I use uh, my domain name and you can try this from your browser, this is a public name. So it should point to that site. Yeah. So you can have your own website like this or any of these templates uh, set up in a few minutes. I just did it in a few minutes in front of you. And now I just have to maybe update this HTML and uh, I'll have my static site available and running completely out of S3, uh, fast, reliable, cheap. You don't pay anything for host uh, or anything like that. You'll just need a host name. Yes, but uh, that's all you will need to host your own website as well. Maybe you build your own resume, uh, DevOps resume and host it. 
on uh, S3 out of that as well. And that's what you can share uh, when you go for the next interview or maybe create a personal site and uh, do that as well. So you can experiment with that. It's very easy uh, to get this done, right? All right, so that's it for this week and today um, that I wanted to demonstrate. And we have built the first part of this, uh, you know, AWS, um, you know, infrastructure. That was our mission for this week. Next week's mission is more or less, uh, not next week, but a week after that, we're going to come back on, uh, let's say, let me check my calendar. It's going to be week of 20, uh, 28th. 28th is when we come back. And uh, that's when we start talking about the next mission. The next mission for us is continuation of this, right? Where we are going to talk about auto scaling. So this is, if this is Cloudify mission, as we call it, the next mission is auto scaling. So just trying to bring my mind map here. Yeah. So that next mission is auto scalify. That's what we're going to talk about uh, a week after that. Uh, in the meanwhile, you can complete the previous missions till five, any work related to that. If you haven't completed that is from our membership portal. So uh, I will be uploading uh, for the last mission and this one, I'll be uploading the recordings and uh, the mission statements, whatever you have to complete uh, out here on the dashboard. And for those of you who are joining from uh, directly this webinar, let me share that application code as well. So this is what I've used during the session and uh, the actual application repository. If you want to try that. Is right here. So if you want to try it out, it's right here. And uh, those of you are members, you already have access to all of this. Plus, you will have access to the recording right from here. And uh, the mission uh, is what you are going to complete for the last week and this week's time. That is what you see on the DMS dashboard. That is a DevOps Mastery System dashboard where you have access to all the courses and stuff. And uh, you also have access to the uh, mission here, the ongoing challenge where you're going to complete uh, Gitify, Pipeline it, and Cloudify. We come back for order Scalify to continue our journey from here on. All right, so I think Deepak wants to ask a question. You can, and if there's a, there are any other question, I'll be here for a minute. Uh, else we'll come, you know, conclude the session. All right, so that's it for this week, folks. So I hope you enjoyed the session. So thank you very much. And if you are watching this on YouTube stream, uh, definitely do uh, subscribe to our channel. And uh, you know you will find the membership details if you are interested in uh, in the you know along with this uh, stream as well. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'm gonna see you uh, on a week after this, basically. So we have a gap of one week and we'll continue after that, this journey of 90 day DevOps journey. So thank you and I'll see you there. Bye.